I am heavy, heavy, heavy bored. and uh and he was like oh i want to suck this book's dick off no chuck palonic i think was actually the guest and he said he loves joy williams and it's funny actually in the version i have i think brett easton ellis does blurb can we have the same version yeah second page of blurbs in the middle one of a kind fiction there's no way to grasp all its dark rich mysteries in a first reading but i'm too scared to read it again or too bored maybe i don't know (sighs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah yeah you can't grasp it all in one read but it's not like the kind where i'm like like i feel frustrated that i didn't catch it all but i was so fucking bored that i didn't try to like it just felt like the same thing over and over again we'll get into it we'll fucking get into it yeah Are you a budding eco-terrorist? No. I don't think I'll ever be an eco-terrorist. I don't care enough. I don't think Alice is either. Yeah. Not really. Get started on this. Fucking Alice, dude. Fucking Alice. Uh, It did... Alright. I guess we should say what this is. What podcast this is. Bored as shit. Yeah. This is bored. This is heavy bored, and I'm Andrew Whitstat. I'm Sophie Weiner. I'm bored as shit right now. <sighs> uh, and for today, we're talking about uh, Joy Williams Pulitzer Prize uh, nominated novel, The Quick and the Dead. This was published in the I think 2000. I think that's when it was nominated as well. Um, Sophie and I read the same. We had, this is one of the rare occasions where we actually have the same version of the book, so we both read the uh, vintage paperback. I believe this was the original publisher, the Vintage Contemporaries. Uh, not sure about that though. Uh, but yeah, we have a rare chance, rare, rare, rare episode where the page numbers add up, match up. Yeah, I know. I put page numbers as I was marking down. I do out of habit, but yeah, it's nice that it we can reference each other. I mean, I wasn't I wasn't taking notes while I was reading this one. I was either falling asleep or trying to blow through it. Yeah, this was one. Uh, this was a slog. Let's introduce Joy Williams, and we'll get to the final thought. We we'll get to the, our initial thoughts here. All right. So if you don't know who Joy Williams is, she's more she's a contemporary writer. Although I believe she's still alive. Yeah. Yeah, she's still alive. Uh, all right, so Williams is the author of four novels, um, and she's been nominated for a lot of stuff. So, like, uh, State of Grace, her first novel, uh, came out in 1973, and that was nominated for the National Book Award. Uh, and then The Quick and the Dead was nominated, was a finalist for the Pulitzer uh, in 2000. Uh, and then she published her first short stories in 1982. That was called Taking Care. Uh, and then a follow-up to that in 1990. Um, a few essay collections, uh, honored guest collection of short stories, uh, was published in 2004. Uh, anyway, so that's that's Joy Williams. She's still kicking. I believe she taught in Ari- at Arizona. That sounds right. I don't remember. I don't know if she's still teaching but, there. She might be past retirement age at this point. But I do think at some point she was teaching at one of the big programs. Yeah, and I think it was Arizona. Arizona State? Yeah, the whichever. I think the one in Phoenix, yeah. Yeah, Arizona State. Yeah. So that is the brief overview of Joy Williams. As I mentioned on the last episode, I'm familiar. I read her uh, her collected short stories. People tend to be a fan of those. And so, like, you know... I would still be interested, even at, okay, 
putting my feelings about this book aside, I would still very much be interested to go look at her short stories and see what those are like. Because I wouldn't be surprised if she was maybe a stronger short story writer or maybe whatever. Just wrote short stories that maybe appealed to me more than her novels do. She takes a long time to put out books. If people listen to that, I guess I didn't get the dates quite right. But yeah, first novel was in the 70s. And then her next novel wasn't until the 80s. And then she put out a few story collections about a decade apart. And then she put out this novel. Like it's, I think she's only written three novels too total. And the rest have just been like short story essays, stuff like that. I The book I read, I think it's called The Visiting Privilege. I believe that's the name of it. I didn't know it. I forgot it last episode, but yeah, that's the one I read. Uh, and I'll be honest, dude, it's it's more or less the same stuff. Uh, it's the exact style. It's the same style. It's the same kind of literary. Nothing happens. Uh, there were a few gems. I think she tends to nail certain aspects in her writing. I guess I'll say better than most uh I'll talk about that too because there's something I did want to talk about in terms of her like capturing the random thoughts that pop into people's heads and all that but it is yeah I found this just initial thoughts I found this to be a slog I found this to be tough to get through and really not so rewarding when you get to the end of it I found it to be the same there was very little reward throughout (laughs) Not that, like, I mean, just in terms of, uh, you know, the pleasures of reading at a certain point, I think I just felt just kind of beat. Like, I kept falling asleep reading it, which is like, whatever, you know, maybe, you you know, if I was reading kind of late at night, sort of passed out, whatever. But even when I was reading during the day, I was just like finding myself not able to like keep my eyes on the paragraph like I kept jumping (laughs) three paragraphs ahead just to see if anything was going to happen you know it was just I was really intrigued by the beginning I was really into this opening like this so we should say this book is split into you know three sections essentially or three books but within it and each has like this little I don't know. How would you describe it? Like, it's almost like an open letter to the reader in some way, or that's what it feels like to me. We can talk about that later, I guess. But, um, and at first it intrigued me, but then it just feels like it's kind of setting up the themes for the book. And then there's so much from it that never like comes back back around except for the first one like it sets up ideas but then you go back and you're like do I have to read this 18 times to actually understand what we're trying to say here it's just this just sort of some kind of lyrical essay like in the beginning but yeah it's um I mean essentially like it follows like these three girls right would you say there are three main characters um Yes. Or like three central characters, Alice being the main character. They're all like, what, 16? They're all motherless. And they're living somewhere in a desert. Presumably like somewhere in Texas or something. I don't know. Um, There are references to Phoenix. So I imagine it's like Phoenix suburbs. Okay. For those of us. Yeah, I don't know. There's a lot of references to Texas, Arizona, and Florida, I think. Right. There's some I think Florida she, in there. I think she did live in Florida for a while. I don't know if she taught there or not. Probably did. Because I think she did write a book on like the Florida Keys, like a nonfiction book. Yeah. But, <clears throat> you know, it's one of those stories where you get chapters of different characters and all their paths cross in some way. Yeah, but not really. For some of them. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess there's three main characters. Although, it, it, my initial thought on this, like reading through it, and as I got from book one to book two to book three, 
which did remind me a little bit of like classic novel writing when they would release it in parts, you know, in magazines mm -hmm. and stuff. So I thought a little bit of like Wharton and things like that. But as I got closer to the end, I just started, couldn't help but think that like, oh my God, this is like a hodgepodge of just like character happenings that are so loosely connected it's almost uninteresting like i wouldn't say almost <laughs> i mean there was just uh, like everything and you know i was bitching to you about this through text because i just i wanted to get it down but like everything that happens happens in the most suppressed way possible <laughs> it either happens like outside of the novel and then like you find out about it through one of the characters or it happens in such a convoluted way like the language is so masked you know with this sort of philosophical whatever um but it's just like you have to keep rereading it to figure out what the fuck is going on. Yeah. Definitely. Is my audio still good? I know like my screen just paused. Yeah, your audio is good. But yeah, my it's showing you frozen on mine. I'll turn my video off for a second. Yeah, see what happens. But yeah, it's still going. Yeah, it worked. But yeah, it's basically like this, we really don't get a setting, we get a loose kind of setting in what I would assume to be yeah, like southern Arizona, or yeah, west Texas, some type of desert landscape, and for those of you that don't know, those of us that live in the desert, um, you know, the cities are basically in the middle of nowhere, right, so all the cities that are in the desert, uh, there's no su like this they're suburbs but like it just ends you know like it's just in the middle of nowhere uh so when i imagine growing up there especially when you're a teenager it could feel very much like you're trapped and i think that is captured in a lot of these characters but i think all teenagers feel like they're trapped when they're doing this but uh yeah the setting the thing is we don't get that much of the setting we just kind of a loose reference to kind of the national parks and the mountain ranges and all that kind of stuff that is you know fills most of that empty space out in southwestern america but i'm not sure how much setting would actually improve this it may ground it a little bit more if we had more setting i wasn't even bothered by that so much i was it was more like the aimlessness of it, which, you know, yeah. I'm sure there are plenty of people out there, you know, who would argue, <coughs> who would argue in favor of that, you know, you don't need a plot. Uh, yeah, dude, the Pulitzer Committee, obviously. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's, here's the thing, it's so fucking smart. <laughs> you know, she's smarter than me. She's smarter than you. She's smarter than most of us. And that's good and fine. Um, I don't need every paragraph to show how smart Joy Williams is via the inner monologue of her characters at great length. Which is like, you know, it can be good, it can be done well, but my God, make something happen. I mean, even the beginning, it's like, God, the most shit happened at the very beginning. Right. Like, I feel like we got so much that was like clear and concrete and set up like what I thought was going to be this interesting story of like the 16 year old girl who was like babysitting these kids. Right. Yeah. And then this fucking psycho lady, you know, the mom of these kids, like picks her up, drives her out somewhere into the desert, like to some park and is like, I'm not fucking paying you suck my dick we're leaving and then like books it out of town leaves her abandoned so like you know miles away from her home and i was like okay interesting and then it's just abandoned like, yeah. and then that's just like oh okay yeah. this is not like part of us like there's no real 
weight to any of this. This is just informing me, I guess, of how the world works and right. how this character responds to the shittiness of the world. And that's actually all that you need that first piece for, I guess. Yeah. I've wrote down in my notes here. I found those like when the beginning sections, when she has these kind of like statements to the reader, there's a couple paragraphs before each book. <sighs> I found those frustrating, much like yeah, I found too. most of the text frustrating. Uh, I don't like rhetorical questions to the reader. I don't. I didn't mind it in the first one. It I... didn't bother me until it eventually did. This is just one of my larger pet peeves listeners may grow familiar with. I cannot stand rhetorical questions as a device in literature. Um, I just, I would much rather prefer, prefer the author telling or showing us instead of like relying on the reader to like read this rhetorical question to make your point. I just don't like it. It's just a big pet peeve of me just because I think it's, it's, it's weak. It's not, it didn't bother me at all. It bothered me that there was no follow through after the fact, like that it was just, and I'm sure there's more there, right? I mean, you'd mentioned that like Brett Easton Ellis, like whatever, you know, Yeah. his little blurb talks about like, oh man, you know, you'll miss the nuance and all of like the ideas that come through in this novel in a first read, but you know, you'd have to go back and read it again to catch them and it's like yeah that's good and fine but i feel like i also didn't get enough of the actual book on the first read and yeah. i feel like um it made sense to me to have that first one that sort of set it up but the more i got into the book i questioned how much that first you know address to the reader was actually doing something other than giving us themes yeah and there were some themes that just irritated me again this or is, is it all... trying to do that thing where it implicates you yeah well this this is all personal pet peeves of mine so i mean i'm sure people could probably think this is stylistically great but i don't happen to be one of them like like that one dude literally the first page do you believe that what has been is also now and that what is to be has already been yeah it gets a little obnoxious i'm just like fuck you dude like this is some philosophical musing like i don't care about that like but it's also but like if, if what it was doing in these parts was actually building that philosophy instead of just presenting you with these questions or yeah. like with these what seem like hypotheticals, right? Like, cause the second one for book two, like I, that's where I was like, wait, what, what? The second one was the one that bothered me. Good morning, Mr. Or Mrs. You have been deemed a candidate by physician slash family slash staff for the terminally ill program. And therefore the following comforts and electives will be denied to you beginning at 3 a.m. this day and extending into any remaining future. It's like, okay, are you telling me that from here on out, this novel is going to be frustrating to read and that nothing is uh. going to happen because I like, I feel like we've already established that. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I guess you could argue, maybe somebody would argue against us here that um, it's trying to show the banality of even awful things that happen to people, just how banal, you know, the banality of evil type thing. Like, it's Well, there's just... like this hopelessness. It's all hopeless. Yeah. Although I would argue I didn't even get a sense of hopelessness out of it. Like I got almost nothing. Like it was like a big blank white space for me. Most of my brain uh with moments of like tickling that like intrigued me and then it would just go back to blank, bland. Yeah, cuz there's no moment where you get to look up and have a breath. Like there's so there are so few moments that are just like pure scene, you know? Where, like, you just have characters in action. 
whether it's conversation or doing something, it's always what's, you know, and like, that's true of any book. Like so much of it is what's going on in the heads of the, um, of the characters, but it was just so like, you never got to sort of pick your head up. There was so little like levity or, and it's not even like it was especially like, depressing either right, right? It, i didn't feel You're... emotionally invested in these characters for the most part the saddest thing the most i felt emotionally invested in something was one of the girl's dogs right uh yeah i'd agree with that i i think it yeah it was i think i said this to you in text message it felt almost like it was like actively punishing the reader and I get that was kind of a thing, particularly like 20 years ago in literary fiction, right? Like I'm thinking like... It was so anti and trendy. Right. Like I'm thinking David Foster Wallace and some of that shit where it's just kind of this long kind of meandering, punishing the reader for even attempting to pick it up. And it's mo more philosophical musings than it is story. Um, and I think this gets to your point where you talk about like the kind of like showing it's more about showing off about the the author's ability than it is about like giving us something, giving us a pleasure or something to enjoy, which I mean, is, yeah, that's sort of yeah. what it felt like. Yeah. Right. Like what, how many of the characters, like, was there like an antagonist here? <sighs> Other mm. than, you know, like nature at large, but also like right. the capitalist enterprise and consumerism. Like, is there like of the characters that exist? Yeah. I would say maybe Alice, you could make an argument that Alice is the antagonist, although she really doesn't do anything. I don't, I don't <laughs> like, think, like, I think, there's a way in which like we're supposed to think that Alice is like cool because she's like a 16 year old and she like think about like how Annabelle like is her you know one of her counterparts right. uh, it's like Alice is sort of in the middle between Corvus and Annabelle right the two other girls so Alice is our main main bitch they're all 16 Annabelle is like the super like sort of you know rich like very materialistic very just you know of the culture and then Corvus is just like actually deeply fucking depressed and like you know done with it and it feels like Alice is like I don't want to be Annabelle I kind of want to be Corvus but I'm actually not her we also like get some sense that you know like Alice lives with her grandparents like <laughs> it's almost like Alice is almost like the knockoff Corvus or that's how she sees herself maybe like she lost her parents but it's because her parents like kind of rejected her you know and it's not through like some big tragedy she still like lives with family like grew up with her grandparents right who are clear like are kind of fucking insane uh. we have her fucking friend Corvus, who's a 16 year old living alone with her like depressed dog because her parents drowned. <laughs> yeah. But then she lives with Alice. Yeah. But also like in that trailer for a minute, it's all very, that it's... moves around. Yeah. And yeah, this was this, I guess it was a trend at the time. Like I can't think of any reason other than, yeah, all the literary novels that were coming out around that time were these long, kind of banal fucking inner monologues, and that's all it was. Like, it was, oh, here's the story. What's the story? Oh, it's an inner monologue. And, yeah, I don't know. I just can't. Maybe that's just me rejecting the generation that came before me. But, yeah. I don't know. I can't take, I can't stand it. Yeah. It got to me. So, like, yeah, I mean, I was just going through and trying to map out, like, what are the big things that, like, 
happen, right? The first, you know, interesting thing, I guess, that happens with a character other than, like, the initial story of Alice where it's just, like, she's watching these two boys and then this woman is like, fuck you, I'm not paying you. Like, that I was emotionally attached to. That I was, like, I was so pissed. I was like, bitch. Yeah. But after that, it really fell off. But I was into, so, like, Annabelle's father, when we first meet him, um, him, he's talking to his wife, who we at some point understand to be dead, and he's just, like, you know, talking with an imagined version of her or with her ghost or something, which later it seems more like some kind of ghost situation. Yeah. Something else that like when that chapter came in and I was reading about this guy talking to his dead wife, uh, I was like, okay, this is something. But then again, again, that kind of leads to, well, there was, (laughs) yeah, there was something in her that felt a little bit like, one of Edith Wharton's bitchy characters. Yeah. That I enjoyed. Yeah, the wife was enjoyable. But then it was like she existed only for that role, you know? And it was fine, but it was just. It didn't move me one way or another after that. Like, it was fun until it didn't do anything interesting, even toward the end. I was like, oh, okay, like, this is interesting. So, like, when this other guy dies, right? So, for some reason, at some point, Alice becomes infatuated with a 26-year-old man. Isn't he older than that? He just tells girls he's 26 or something. Yeah, I don't But, uh, yeah, and that's, like, very... (laughs) It's like no one's going around being like, hey, why the fuck are you talking to 16-year-olds? Um... It was the 90s. Uh... <laughs> you know, and Alice has been like hanging out with him, his apartment. At some point they say, I love you to each other, which I was like, what? And like, you can feel how meaningless it is, but you're also like, it almost, that's what I mean. Like, that's why she feels like a knockoff Corvus almost. Or that's how she, I think she thinks of herself. Cause like, she kind of has these urges like that, but she also like wants to, seems to want to deny that also um like wants to be morbid and interesting yeah but um it yeah, is like, like after this... this guy is like he i know that you know he eventually dies but at first i was like oh there's a scene toward the end where he's talking to carter's dead wife right yeah. He's talking to Annabelle's father's dead wife. And as of yet, you know, the father was the only one who could talk to her. And so when this 26-year-old or however old he is, is talking to her at this party, you're like, oh, shit, are we about to find out that he's actually dead and get some backstory as to how he died? But that is not what it was. Yeah, that's I kept texting you about this where there was this I kept there were great starts. Great starts to like interesting storylines. And this is don't I don't want to make people think that like oh, you know, it has to have a, a plot or a storyline which like it doesn't, right? Like obviously it doesn't. But it's just if you're not going to give us any type of pull through, if you're not going to take this little thing that you set up here and then give us the cause and effect of it in any regard, then you better like, you know, supplement that with something else. Like you have to do it with something else to keep the reader going through. And it just, I just, that's part of the thing that frustrated me so much. Yeah. There's this character Ray that we meet. (laughs) Who I guess had a stroke when he was a kid and some part of a monkey was put in into his body somewhere. Or is it like in his brain? Like part of a monkey brain is in his brain or some shit? I don't know. Yeah, that's interesting. And that was one of the more interesting parts too is because I think the monkey was supposed to imply that this guy was crazy, right? Like... Well, I think it was also that, but, like, 
you know, it came from somewhere, right? It came from the <coughs> sort of monkey. Like, this monkey died to save me. <laughs> right? Like, that was sort of his backstory. And so he talks about this little monkey that's, like, in his head. But, like, honestly, like, I didn't fucking follow his story. Or why he was there. His story was he was basically a drifter that ended up hiking and then... We don't even see the series of events that leads the two girl, the three girls to find him and like tie him up. That was probably the peak of the story for me. And that happens in book one, right? Yeah, <laughs> like, and I was confused by that chapter. I was like, you know, like it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, okay, it's fine. Like we skip from, you know, perspective to perspective and we're going to like miss some events. Right. And like jump in time and whatever. But it was, like, so jarring sometimes that to, like, try to orient yourself to what was happening. And like I said, so much of it was so suppressed anyway that it was just like, okay, like, as I'm reading, it's like I have to go back through the paragraph and be like, okay, so he found a dead ram. Uh, Is that actually what happened? You know, okay. like, and... You know, okay, so he's with the girls now, and I'd be going back and being like, did I miss something? Like, did they meet up at some point? Did they just hike, happen to be hiking in the same spot? Whatever. Fine. Um, there's some story that the girls were going to go camping or something. We never actually see them leave to go camping, I don't think. Um, yeah. And all, the last thing I remember of Ray was that he had broken free from the ropes. Right? Yeah. And then the ne there's this, like, one, like, fucking one-off chapter with these two characters who, like, we know nothing of and have never met. And this is, like, how far into the book was Probably that? Probably, like, 150 pages. More than that, I think. It was, like, one nine. I want to say 193 is what I had in my notes, I think. I think it was... Uh, yeah. Well, 150 was when Hickey came it's in. It's a little... It's more than halfway. So yeah. it's, like, end of book two, beginning of book three. And it's just, like, these seemingly rich parents who, like, are in Florida... So that's one of the places where we do get a setting. The the webs. Dinah and Dick Webb. <laughs> Those are okay names. Um, and an officer comes to inquire, like, and say, you know, are you the parents of Ray, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, no. And they're like, oh, we have some bad news for, you know, his parents. And he's like, oh, no, not not for me. And they just sort of, like, assume that he's probably dead, but, like, send the officer away. And they're like, oh, it's not us. Right. I and I'm was... like, okay, that's Ray's whole story. It's like we knew him for two minutes. He went on the, like, you know, we hear about this whole monkey thing. He had this stroke. He's got, like, sort of, like, a slack part of his mouth that doesn't really move. He, like, stole some cowboy boots and a hat. For some reason, he thought blue snakeskin was a good way to go, which makes me think that he's a fucking idiot. And he's only, he's supposed to be, like, 19 or something, right? That, I don't remember. I actually assumed him to be older, I think. I assumed all these characters to be older than they were because they were written as if they yeah. were full-fledged adults. As if they were in their 30s having yeah. like, a true existential crisis. And understood Quite all. The language of, like, yeah. Which, like, you expect to some degree, right? Like, when we talked about this with Stephen King, like, he's really good at writing children, but it's not just because of the way he uses the language. It's because he's good at navigating the way kids make associations. Yeah, and, like, fill in, in the ignorance yeah. with with you know an imaginary thing or fill in the 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 adult motivation with like a childish one like that's what makes king good at the uh child's perspective but yeah i mean this i guess this has always kind of been a thing 
Yeah, I don't think that's like uncommon for the character to come off, you know, to use a language that is clearly coming from a person who is more knowledgeable and older than they are. But like, even when we meet this eight year old girl, I was like, no. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's when I was like, all right, this is where I draw the line. I don't be- like, I don't believe this. Yeah. I don't, I didn't either. The eight year old was a little much. And she came in so late to the story that I was just like, come on. Like, an editor. Like, didn't... I think of, yeah, like... I think of the way, like, even I know that you're not a big fan, but I think of like the way that, George Saunders writes the inner monologue of a 16 year old or a 15 year old or whatever. And I'm like, yeah, this is like on point. This is what that inner monologue should sound like, or like some, you know, it, it's on the right wavelength yeah. for, you know, where a 16 year old would be. Yeah, I'm not a huge fan of stuff I've read of Saunders, but... Uh, Have you read Victory Lap? No, like I said, I was about... Yeah, in his defense... Dude, I think you might like yeah. Victory Lap. It's good. Well, in it's his... A... Yeah, in his defense, it's... I haven't read his... Most of his stuff, but the little... The few things I have, I'm not a fan, but yeah. I mean, his voice is pretty fucking distinctive, so there's a strong chance that you just won't like him. Right. Well, that's what I mean. I didn't... Uh, yeah. His, but if yeah. you like were going after it, like what did you read like a novel or No, I read that story. I've only read the stuff that he's published, like you know, New Yorker or you know, when everybody's whenever he puts out a story people just get all over his dick. Uh, um no, you should read you should read a Victory Lap. It's the first. It's the first story in Tenth of December. I guess we're gonna have to add Saunders to the fucking list. Yeah, dude. I thought I did already. Yeah, I think we should, did. I just want to force you to read Tenth of December. Yeah, I'll read it. I should read it. Yeah, before I before I make any sweeping judgments. But yeah. Uh, my first thing was about Alice. My first question that I wrote for you was. Um, are we supposed to be annoyed or off-put by Alice? I had a similar version of this question for you, too. Like, what are we actually... Well, I mean, that's what I mean, like, by is there an antagonist here at all? Or are we just supposed to... Like, there's this part of me that thinks that we're really supposed to be impressed by her. Yeah, I think that's the way she's written. Like, it's like Ladybird, like, know-it-all yeah. teenager... Who just knows more than every I'm adult? Up. Yeah, I'm yeah. dark. Yeah, and there's this weird, like the inner monologue with Alice is good. Probably some of the better inner monologues in the sto- in the novel, but it's like, I yeah, there's something about the inner that makes me just be like, yeah, like this girl doesn't even believe her own thoughts i i don't know yeah and there's no point at which we get sort of an outsider perspective that'll say like you know like that that third person omniscient which i guess it is written in right like it's written in third person omniscient but you don't actually get what would feel like would be the objective move there which is to explain how Alice is thinking versus like what is underneath it what she actually felt and it's all so like there are so many moments where it's like lyrical and it's beautiful I mean with her and Corvus who we get so little of Corvus gets how many chapters? Corvus gets almost nothing. She gets a couple in book one and then basically disappears. In terms of seeing the world through her eyes, so seeing her perspective as we do. Yeah, we see it maybe three times through her eyes. And that's mostly in book one, and then she basically just becomes like a you know afterthought in the in the novel. I would say Uh, because she is so. I mean, you know, her story is probably the most tragic. Her parents. She's the one that we actually see lose her parents in the novel. 
everyone else's parents or we are, we see, you know, we hear about them losing their parents, but hers are the ones where we're like, okay, that happened the most recently. And, you know, it's like that summer before it's basically. It's the most tragic. It feels yeah. the most tragic, right? Like, because even with Annabelle, right, who also like, she lost one parent. She lost, So they're all without their mothers, yeah. at least at minimum, right? But we come to find out, obviously, that her mother is, like, a bitch and didn't give a shit about her and didn't actually like her very much as a, right. like, human, didn't really care about being a mom. Or so we think, because I guess we're, you know, it's unclear as to how true she is to who she was. Yeah. Or whether it's just, like, Carter's, you know, her widows, her but widowers. If I had to give an answer, I would say I'm not so much annoyed by Alice. I did find her annoying towards the end because she was just so like full of inner monologue and not much else. But I that was more like stylistic stuff I was annoyed with than the actual character. Yeah. But I definitely found her off-putting. And I think she's supposed to be. I, well, that's the thing. I think she wants to be off-putting, but she actually has like deeper human desires that she was is like struggling to come to terms with because you know, she's like an awkward fucking teenager that. And I, I'm going to say this and, as we just no, go ahead, finish first. Cause I'm going to go off topic. Well, like, cause she's an awkward fucking teenager who like wants to be all dark and interesting, but she also is attracted to boys. Like, yeah, she's you know, a normal, yeah, she's a person. Yeah, like, <laughs> like, you know, yeah. She's also just like a 16 year old girl. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's one thing I think we just spent all this time bashing the novel. I think we just spent like 30, 40 minutes, but it's the one thing I think Joy Williams is, I would say, I would go as far, even though I'm not a huge fan of her style, now that I've read her short story collection and her kind of, one of her big novels, one thing I think Joy Williams is better at than any other writer I've seen, any other thing I've read, is that this kind of this conflicting idea of the very human nature of we're performing we're even performing our own thoughts in our head kind of thing and i think she captures that better than almost any other author i've ever read particularly i'm thinking like the random sexual thoughts that pop into characters heads for like a split second and then they kind of like dismiss them and we keep going i think that she captures that in a way that is just beyond any other writer i've read that's like okay that is human like that is like the most human thing like just that random stupid thought when you're mid conversation listening to somebody and then you're thinking some random sexual thought and then you just kind of push it down uh, she's very good at doing this with both male and female characters. She's incredible at, uh, cause again, it's just a human thing. I guess yeah, it's not even, doesn't even matter in terms of male female. It's literally just like a human. Yeah. I thought she was good at that too. I, and you know, like we bash this one a lot, but there would be little denying here. I think that she's, you know, technically speaking a good writer. Right. Like, yeah, everybody has their and own taste. Writes, like yeah. some really fucking beautiful prose, and like if she, you know, like I, like I said, I'm still interested to like read her short stories. I've had a hard time getting through this particular book. It's the same thing, dude. Uh, but I would, yeah. But like, I think doing that over the course of a short story is a, has a much different effect than doing it over the course of an entire fucking novel. You know, reading 10 pages of this is a different thing to me than reading 300 pages of it. Yeah, the specific, the thing that made me write that down, especially like the kind of fleeting sexual thoughts, was uh, page 142 uh, when they have Ray tied up in like the desert <laughs> and he's asking for aspirin. Uh, and they, <laughs> they popped one in his mouth and then he's like, could I have about a half dozen more, Ray asked, and some water? And then, like, the inner monologue or the narration goes, uh, there was something vaguely quasi-religious to this, even sexual. Not at this exact moment, of course, but possibly <laughs> at a future moment. Three oh, chicks yeah. and an American male, bondage and threat, great lawless fun just waiting for the unexpected spark, three flower plots waiting to be seeded or waiting for his seed. He was at their mercy and their service. 
he could do it. He just had to coast out his out this headache, keep being congenial. Uh, and then, yeah, and then it just kind of disappears. It goes on for like two more sentences, but then it just kind of, that thought gets pushed away, right? It's just this brief moment of like, this guy having this sexual thought as he's being tied up by these three young women, flower pots in need of his seed. And then it's just dismissed. And then it just moves on that he's talking about his headache after that. And he just keeps talking about his headache. And then it's like, all right. I think she just, and she does this with Alice. I think Alice, like where she doesn't, she does this well too. And one of her short stories, I don't want to get on something we didn't read this week, but her one short story, I can't even remember the name of it, but the one that I thought was the best in that collection I read was this one about these two like 15, 14 year old girls at a boarding school and they're like spying on their like hot young male, you know, English teacher or history teacher. It's always an English or history teacher kind of thing. And like the one friend like doesn't actually want to do it, but like she's just doing what her other friend said. And like, then you hear like the one friend who's like telling her to like spy on this guy doesn't actually think he's hot either she's just like doing it because she thinks she's supposed to and i just thought now that is the brilliance of joy williams like that's what she's able to capture this kind of weird performance of it yeah like this kind of even in our own heads we're like we're issuing this kind of rationalization for our performance or outward performance and the kind of confusion so when you're young and you're doing that obviously it's confused and it's more confused than you are when you're an adult i guess or you would like to think but yeah uh, another question I had to is Alice, are we supposed to think Alice is a liar? What do you mean? Well, her boyfriend in prison and all this kind of stuff. Oh, well, I like... mean, I think that's, well, to some degree, yes, but I think that's all part of her trying to cultivate this really, like, edgy, dark appearance, but right. also, like, in a very, you know, I think sort of 16-year-old way, just, like, wanting to, like choose how people see you and one of those ways is to not be single and realizing that you can choose how people see you kind of like that's a very big step in the coming of age stories but like there's that moment when her and sherwin say i love you and it's just so like vomity you know on 109 this is another moment where, like, right just before we got a, this whole thing about how Alice is, like, bruised up, and we get this little explanation of why she's bruised, and she had, like, thrown a rock at some motorcyclist or something, and he had skidded, and her helm is he, like, had his helmet, and, like, he skidded back toward her and, like, smacked her in the face with it. Yeah, it was like a mountain right. biker, right? Like a guy doing like yeah, a mountain biking shit. down a trail, which is very common out here in the Southwest. Yeah, like just people go... Because, I mean, the mountains are everywhere, and it's usually not raining, so you can take a mountain bike and tear it up if you're into mountain biking, but... Yeah, that was just like one of those moments where we get an explanation of a thing, and I'm like, that could have been a scene <laughs> like where yeah, something yeah. exciting happened, and instead we just got this, like confusing moment of wait why what happened to her face and then like we then get the explanation of what had happened and you're like oh and then right after that there's this i love you moment where all of a sudden out of fucking nowhere she says i love you she said cautiously and he says i love you too and then she says this disappointed her (laughs) (laughs) yeah (laughs) which is like kind of funny right because it's just like this you know she's so like fucking infatuated with this guy who's like you know fucking 30 or whatever and she's 16 he's like twice her age i just like there's this part of me that's like bitch you don't find it weird right later this doesn't (laughs) freak you out it's like a 16 year old but i guess she's trying to be so edgy but that's what i mean like there are these moments where i'm like couldn't we have like cultivated a what's a, I don't know maybe like a slightly more honest version of this Alice who is actually a little less sure of herself than she is showing the world so I feel like no one is that good at it at 16 maybe I'm just like <laughs> maybe I just didn't know any of those people he heard water running into the sink then it stopped and he heard her taking an, admir- an admirable piss Oh, yeah, the admirable piss. Yeah. And then they talk about it. 
When she came out, he said, you pissed like a horse, Alice. It sounds great. Oh, thanks, Alice said distractedly. <laughs> yeah, little things like that. <clears throat> I don't know. Yeah. But she then, got yeah. a gold replacement with an emblem on it. This is after her tooth falls out. Maybe a scorpion. But that's what nose rings did. She didn't want to be considered a nose ring. Yeah. What do, what do, we, what do you think Williams means by nose ring? I think we know. Yeah, what do you think? Just, uh, I remember I wrote a poem once about this, yeah, like the nose-ringed girl in class. I'm edgy. Yeah, and this was in 2000, so it was just becoming like an edgy thing before it, like professors had it and shit. So... I'm edgy, but it's because I'm hot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm dangerous. But it's like also that's what she's trying to cultivate. Right. I don't want to be a nose ring, but I also don't want to be cool. But I also want normal things. Yeah, and it's this conflicting thing. Maybe it is. I guess would we call this a coming of age story? Would you? I mean, because it's tough to say. Because we seems don't. Seems like it. Yeah. Yes, I think it. Like all of the stuff, all of the setup is there. But is there ever, like, I guess there's just, you know, not the part where anyone comes of age. <laughs> there's no fulfillment. There's, like, a moment. Like, we get more of a change in, like, that fucking taxidermy guy at the end than we do of any of the main characters. And Alice seems the one that would be ripe for some type of coming of age, either of her going full blown into like the eco terrorism side. That's kind of what I was expecting. Like her yeah, kind me of too. meeting up with Ray and them kind of doing something together. And that would make more sense to this 19 year old boy. Would and have this, been more exciting. Yeah. And this 16 year old girl, um, or it would have been more exciting if the girls just killed that guy in the middle of the desert. Like that would have been, yeah. Have something. Been yeah. Fucking something. Yeah. And I was like, God, you know, like when we got sort of, I was close to the end and I read most of this book in one day, right? Because like I was just fucking, I mean, I was busy, but so fucking boring. And I got to like, a, <sighs> you know, a certain point I was like, dude, just like put me out of my misery. Tell me something happens. Tell me what happens. Give me something to look forward to. And like once you told me that someone died, I was like, okay. <laughs> but it's like even that like could have been so much more satisfying there could have been something bigger happening toward the middle point of the novel. Although, like, would you, I would argue that maybe the big thing that happens there is Corvus's house. But we already know that's happening just from the back of the book. Don't we? I, I don't know. I'd be, I'd be hard pressed to say that there's like a big, big change in one of the characters they kind and maybe that's i think that's why i think you could argue that the point that williams is trying to make if she's trying to make a point at all right i mean this is, we talk about this from time to time but yeah i mean maybe we're projecting meaning onto something or we're trying to, maybe this novel isn't trying to do anything except to show us you know these three girls in kind of like the summer before their junior senior year of high school kind of uh but yeah, I would say that there is no direct change. And, and you don't, again, not that we have to, oh, you have to have that for it to be a good story. I mean, we know that you don't, right? There are plenty of stories, novels that don't have that and they're great, but it's, I don't know what it is. I, we just don't get enough of anything in this. Well, we don't, don't get enough of what Alice actually wants, right? Like so much of what happens in her head other than like maybe you know, her feelings about her friends or what she wanted them to think, like when she's scared that Corvus is like mad at her or something or can sense that Annabelle doesn't really give a shit about her. So much of what we hear from Alice is just about like how everything's all fucked up and the world is bullshit and like, you know, uh, the sugar cane industry as you know ending the world or something yeah it's... or just like a general like you know fuck all of these people not 
taking care of Mother Earth. And it's it feels there's a lot there that feels impersonal and like maybe we're supposed to get the sense that oh she's just like repeating the shit from her grandparents who we get you know who we learn are kind of indoctrinating her into this kind of ideology I guess but um, yeah there's like with all of the characters I feel like you get such a nothing glimpse into who they actually are and what they actually want except no maybe that's just Alice because I feel like I say the only character you get what they like, actually want. You know want. what Corvus wants, but it's obvious. She wants her parents to not be dead. Yeah, and I would say even more than that, because Corvus kind of fades away, I would say we, we learn what Annabelle wants, which is Annabelle just wants like a normal, yeah, I guess more of like upper class, but still just like she wants the things that most people claim yeah. to want. She misses her mom, but like also under like has an awareness that her mom didn't give a shit about her, Like, but she just like wants to have like nice things and like a nice yeah. life basically <laughs> like that's like you know just normal shit that most yeah. people would so maybe she's supposed to be used as the thing which is also seemingly what corvus wants except she doesn't care carter you know, the, the we classes can, carter we kind of get what he wants, wants to fuck douglas donald donald yeah <laughs> and does both bad names yeah we don't actually see them fucking, but we do get the the sense that, yeah, they're giving each other gifts. They're, they're hanging clearly, out together. They're clearly yeah. banging. Yeah. They're clearly like a thing. Yeah. And like, we're supposed to find Carter to be obnoxious, right? Like maybe not in his one-on-one -on -one time, but like when he's just talking to Ginger, but like when we hear what he's talking about and passing with friends at these dumb parties, he throws to not feel desperate and lonely. Uh, like it's just like at all, so many of the characters were supposed to find obnoxious. Even Sher Sherwin, I found pretty obnoxious, but at least there were parts to his character that felt honest to me. Right. Yeah, it's it's a very weird, and that's when we, and then like, yeah, about 150, you know, 190 pages into this, we start getting those characters that are like, haven't appeared yet in the first 150 pages. We get those two guys that end up killing Ray by accident, like, uh, when they're shooting the cactus. Oh, yeah. And they kill Ray, and then we get that Emily girl, that little, I almost said that Emily bitch. I don't even <laughs> I don't even remember the chapter where they killed Ray. Yeah, well, it's really inconsequential. Uh, Maybe I skipped it. Yeah, it's very inconsequential. And it did feel like it was a missed opportunity. And this, again, coming from a personal perspective of just my taste and stuff, it did seem like a missed... Ooh, you should have left that guy wandering the desert and he could have come back at some point and made like a great little loop around, but... You know. I just wanted something to feel like as much of a big hurrah as it right. could. Like, there were so many almosts, you know? Yeah. That which... it's just like, even when Sherwin dies at the end by fucking falling, like, what, he fell into a mirror? Or like a plate glass window? It, that or was like unclear. And I kept trying wall. to figure out, like, yeah. I can see how you would get, like, badly sliced, course, you know? Yeah. But that it's just like, oh, and you felt the glass, like ribbons of glass, like go <laughs> puncturing his lungs and his heart. And I'm just like, what fucking, like, how? Like, what did he, how did this glass break? Like, what did, at what angle is it sitting that the way he falls into it? I mean, if you fell into something drunk, like even like a shower wall or something, yeah, it would probably shatter and you get hurt. Uh, yeah, you definitely get fucking hurt, but like. I was just trying to think about like of the fucking shards of glass going straight into right. your chest. And maybe that's not true to what was happening, but like, you know, but, but I don't fucking know. Yeah. It it just all felt really this could have been an exciting moment. And then it's just like we get past that moment and then he's just dead and time has passed and we don't even get like like, God, that could have been such a fucking scene. Right. You know? 
of like this big grand fucking party in this big grand house. Well, that's what I mean. It's like the actual cause and effect that you would expect. And there's some like 26 year old or whatever, like dead in Carter's bedroom. Right. Or dying in Carter's bedroom. As we learn, he doesn't like die right away either. Yeah, that's what I mean. So, like, the cause and effect thing that we would expect in most story creation is not there. It's kind of almost, and like, we've been talking this whole time. It feels like it's purposely suppressed. And it, withheld. Yeah, and that's fine. That's, a, you know, that's a technique. You can do that. It's And it's yeah. important in some places. Like, withholding is important in some places so that you can reveal things later. Or, like, you know, in a more interesting way. Like, you don't tell someone every single thing about a character up front if you, right. like, hope for them to ultimately grow. Yeah. Or you don't, like, tell them everything. You don't tell the reader everything a character knows if you want to surprise them in some ways about this character or whatever it is, you know? There are things you can withhold, whatever it is. It doesn't have to be about the character. Yeah, but then when we get to the point where there's like some like pivotal action, like it's something that takes place and it, we're confused. It happens outside of the book. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, like we don't get it. And, that, and at least we yeah. got Sherwin's death. Like that was one small thing. We got, and we got Corvus burning her house. But again, like even the language there kind of suppresses what was happening. I was confused for a minute about what Same. was happening. I was like, yeah. did she kill her dog it like took me a couple of reads over that page and a half to figure out like oh no this shitty neighbor who keeps bitching right. about her yowling dog hanged her dog right and then she burnt the ha her family home down yeah i'm like and nothing happened <clears throat> and I, I see this happen in I mean, I only know about this because I do it myself sometimes. Like when you're struggling or you're stuck on something and you're working on it, this is writing wise. And then like you just start adding more and more <laughs> and more kind of arbitrary shit because you're kind of stuck and you got to work it out. Right. And I feel like that's what we got in this novel is we just got more and more and more and then it just ends. And then we're just like, okay, this is so convoluted. This is so all over the place that we, I think that's why I feel, I think we both feel that like we were kind of like almost irritated, like frustrated with the novel. Like, well, yeah, it was, it just, it felt like a bunch of false starts and anytime something happened, it wasn't happening on the page. And if any of it did, it was inconsequential. So it didn't matter to any of the stuff that came after. Yeah. That's what I mean. So the lack right, of like cause and effect. Corpus burns her family home down after what's his name jim crimmins hangs her dog her really like old dog that is like desperately misses corvus's mom burns the house down she's a 16 year old <laughs> do we know that it's crimmins that kills the dog I, I missed that completely yeah i mean that's what it seemed like and again it took me going back <laughs> And, and like then because in the next chapter they are talking about how Jim Crimmins has disappeared immediately following the incident and since he was the one who he like kept calling the school when Corvus was at school to complain about the howling of the dog so Corvus kept leaving school makes this plan I guess to like I don't remember. I, it was unclear to me what that phase was. Like I, when that was all happening, I was like, what's happening? Like she's making a plan to like leave and live in this trailer with the dog or something. Or is, was that right? She was like, going to live in the airstream and just basically be like a hobo. Yeah. Um, Which you can she, do out here. I mean, but you can, she gets home you know. and you know, after like the second time or third or fourth you know encounter she's had with jim crimmins about her howling dog uh she comes home to find like that's you know one of the windows is shattered and the dog is out front hanging right and then we have that brief scene with emily and her mom where crimmins gets his dick blown off 
Yeah, well, we get we first get an introduction to Emily, in which I'm like, this is an eight year old. But it's very confusing. So Emily Bliss Pickless, <laughs> and they call her Pickles, right? Yeah, I think so. But it's Pickless, uh, and she's an eight year old that corrects everybody. Yeah. Yeah, God, that was frustrating. I me. when the dick got blown off. That was the the moment. That was one of the first, not the first, but like the big moment where I was just kind of like I had to go back and be like, wait, what just happened? Because it's not fucking there. Like it's barely on the page. And I'm just like, wait a minute, dick blown off. Yeah. Um... Where was that? And it was like, oh, it was right here where the package blows up. We don't actually say anything yeah, or we see don't... anything. We just. The medic says afterwards, like, that's how we, like, realize that his dick is missing, is that the medic that comes in is like, well, you know, find it, we can reattach it. Yeah. Which is true for most expendages, but it's dick like... Dick is just cleanly blown off somewhere. Yeah, it's a and bomb. Then, and then Emily actually finds it and, like, kicks it into a hole. Yeah, the iguana den or whatever. And there's, like, this sense that, like, maybe... So, like, the back of the... Here's the thing. The back of this book talks about Jim Crimmins, without naming him, as an aging big-game hunter who finds spiritual renewal in his infatuation with an eight-year-old. Well, that's that's not him, right? That's the guy that owns the museum. That's not Crimmins. Oh, fuck. That's so confusing. So, like, they make Jim Crimmins seem... Like, creepy, but not like he's going to do some weird shit, you know? Like, I mean, he's going to do some weird shit, but it's not going to be, like, some creepy sexual harass shit. I mean, maybe. They do make him pretty creepy. But she, like, clearly kind of hates him. Yeah. Clearly, the eight-year-old doesn't like the mom's boyfriend, who is Crimmins, and... Crimmins gets his dick blown off because Emily brings home that like package she picks up on the street and Crimmins sits on his lap to open it and it blows up although we don't actually get that on in the page um well it's like there's an ex and then an explosion happens and then he's like yelling and she's like call 911 and yeah there's just like come on like if this is gonna happen let's make it fucking happen I mean, you know, that's just, like, the part of me that wants, like, some kind of grotesquery going on. The thing is, (laughs) is grotesque could have worked in this novel very well. Well, I mean, and it's there when they're actually talking about the dick, right? Yeah, the dick that That was That had to be it, Emily surmised, though it couldn't be the whole thing. It didn't look like it was the whole of anything. Some ants were already investigating it in the way they investigated everything, by crawling all over it. Um, She nudges it a little, she nudges it around, tips it into a hole, and then she sort of taps it in. It seemed a little spongy, and she didn't want... and didn't want to go all the way in, so she ground it in. And it's just sort of like, okay. Like, even that, like, it was fine. Felt very much in line with the rest of this book. But it's just like, everyone has precisely the same attitude, it feels like. Yeah, there was that. Yeah, everybody was kind of the same, even though they weren't kind of thing. And also, this like, speaking of that fucking Hunter and his infatuation with this eight-year-old... Like, I thought that was weird as shit, too. I'm like, why are you weird. hanging out with this little girl? Like, what is this theme also? It was very <laughs> weird. <clears throat> also didn't make a lot of sense. of older men hanging out with girls that are clearly too young to be hanging out with them. Yeah, and he drives a limo, and it's, yeah, it's very... Yeah, I don't get it. I didn't, I didn't get most of this. And it's never addressed by those people like that are doing the thing that is obviously wrong (laughs) that they have an awareness that they're doing a thing that is obviously wrong when it's so like clearly taboo you know and i think that's where we miss it and those characters like what you were saying about alice sort of that sense of being torn a little bit 
the yeah. performative thing versus like what's actually going on in her mind or like her own uncertainty about things like as she's doing them and we don't get that with these like you know old dudes hanging out with a 16 and 8 year old respectively yeah I actually have a question about that but I, uh, I have to pee real quick but yeah that's you gotta... You gotta use the sound of you pissing and flushing somewhere. Yeah, I usually cut it out, but... We gotta figure out a use for it. It's the sound of me peeing. ASMR. You piss like a horse, Alice. That's uh, great. Just put out a super cut of all the times you've pissed. Yeah, that I've pissed on recording. But yeah, all that leads me to <clears throat> a question, because I would say this book relies heavily on metaphor... So we've talked about how we're not actually getting descriptions. We're getting more metaphors for what's happening as we are reading through here. And it lead me to this question as like, at when does metaphor become unclear and start to obscure meaning? So I guess I'm kind of getting to the limits of metaphor and description. Are you talking about like an extended metaphor or just like the general like level of figuration that is happening throughout I guess, I guess, yeah, the level of figuration is a better way. Amount. But I just, yeah, like, they're not actually... Yeah, I, yeah, it gets exhausting, I think is the answer. <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. When, when every it, scene requires the reader to decipher this figuration... Well, because it's not just, like, reading, you know, a, a long and winding sentence, right? Right. It's bringing in a lot of outside knowledge like from very you know different worlds whether it be you know literary or philosophical or you know visual art or talking about like the environment kind of shit um and like specific references to things that were going on in the environment or specific uh whatever whatever it is like there's all of this shit and it's so hard like packed into these really tight spaces i mean and even you know i don't think i think it would be really hard to pin down um even like that first bit right like you read it expecting that initial sort of letter to the reader I guess, to be setting something up. And I don't know if it sets more up than there is a a nothingness to life and there is little difference between being alive and being dead. Right. Like, or, you know, it. like, do you consider the gulf between the material and spiritual worlds only apparent? Right. Like, you know, that's something that you expect in a poem, right? Like, the appearance of only that way. The yeah. gulf between the material and spiritual worlds only apparent. So there is a... Do you consider there to be an obvious difference between the material and spiritual worlds, is what she is asking here. The dead have certain obligations. Is one of them to remember us? Do you find that offensive? Which I thought was kind of funny and smart, actually. I, like, enjoyed this first one, like I said. Do you find the dead ridiculous? How about the dead finding the living ridiculous? Nothing we do is inevitable, but everything we do is irreversible. How do you propose to remember that in time? Which would you prefer to have your life compared to? Wind or dust? Why? Sorry. Right. I guess I'm a dust man myself. Yeah, I don't fucking know. But yeah, I think this novel, the reason I asked that question was just, I think it was a good lesson for me in terms of the limits of figuration, where our own figuration can honestly do little more than obscure the meaning we're trying to go for. Well, I think the problem here is that with, like long form fiction it's a spe- well there's like there's so little to anchor it 
it's it feels like it's there because in some ways there's nothing happening and it's like this constant telling you nothing is happening right this is a story about the nothingness of life <laughs> and it's just it yeah i think it is certainly limited in a novel especially when you don't have something to anchor it down like if you don't have a plot to work with and i tend to prefer and i think you know is it is human and common and um you know, the novels that sell the most copies are ones that are sensational and have action and like whether or not the characters are all that deep, you know, people talk about that, like how like character drives action or story or whatever you want to say. And like you can certainly make that argument, but to a certain extent, if you can't just follow at a basic level what the story is about like okay we know it's about these three girls but then we keep get adding in new perspectives of new characters who may or may not have anything to do with these girls some in some cases they don't yeah and we don't see much character arc in any one place even with alice right how has she evolved by the end Right. Has she, like, that's why, like, are these characters static? And is that the problem before the prose itself? Is it that, is the problem actually that nothing happens and it's like being supplemented? <laughs> like, I think even like with a writer, like, you know, I was thinking about something like The Sun Also Rises, which I also did not enjoy very much and also found to be a slog because, again, there isn't much plot never read it but the characters do feel more honest to me maybe that's because we see them do more things that are that feel honest right and you know this is a book that does talk about like the performative nature of a lot of things and i'm like is this whole book just just that a bunch of characters (sighs) being largely performative like and that's what we're supposed to take away from it. Yeah, I guess we could make arguments about it being larger. We haven't even gotten to Nurse Daisy, dude. I'd say Nurse Daisy was probably my favorite character. That fucking retirement home. I feel almost nothing for any of the characters. I almost felt something for Ray. Right. Yeah, I mean, that's an but, issue. Yeah, I don't you know, have to love the characters, but shouldn't I kind of care what's happening to them? At least one of them. Yeah. If you're not invested in the character, you, if you have, if you're not going to give us a plot to be invested in, like how it ends. And then if you're not going to give us characters to be invested in, like where they end up, then we're really just left with the figuration on the page. And I get that there's, you know, there's a full, plenty of people that are just into the art for art's sake. You know, it's like this whole, is it just like nothing happens? Yeah, I mean, it's The world is fucked up. Like, that's sort of just what it feels like to me. Yeah. Everything is fucked. Nothing actually happens or changes, except everything is always moving more and more towards death and towards nothing. Yeah. And actually we're all basically dead right now. Well, there's no difference between it. Or like if there's some other deeper statement that it's making that I'm not catching because I can't like, cause I was just fucking bored <laughs> and I was just blowing through it and I didn't. Yeah. Like, you know, it wasn't like, oh, I want to sit with this moment for a minute and reread this passage and think about it because that was every passage, you know, it was every other paragraph that was like that dense. And, you know, it's not to say there's anything wrong with writing in a way that feels dense, but I, but does it actually amount to anything or does it elevate this novel in any way for me? And I would say, you know, there are moments where, yes, it does. And it initially attracted me to it. Right. But I thought also that things would happen. Yeah. 
maybe I think that's where the limit is, right? So it's been a recurring question on this podcast so far, pretty much since we've done the King book, where it's like, okay, what is the boundary between what we would call literary and pop? And then not only that, there's like a different boundary between what we call like high, high literary and then like, I don't know. Like, I don't know. Yeah, well, but this is like, I mean, yeah, well, go ahead. Well, I just mean like there's like when you think of something that we hold up as like great works of literary fiction, I'm thinking like Great Gatsby and stuff like that, uh, all that kind of shit. It's not plotless. Like, it's not like, it, in fact, I mean, in something like Gatsby, there's a very high body count. There's a lot of fucking death. Like, there's a lot of yeah, people, man. like a lot of shit happening, even though we kind of get this. I don't know. Yeah, it just... Give us a love story, if nothing else. There's plenty of literary fiction that balances that sort of... Even if, like, it uses high diction or, um, you know, it has is pretty heavy-handed in figuration, which many, I would say, many literary novels are in a lot of ways something is happening that connects like the sort of inner turmoil or you know what is going on inside of the central character characters like there is something to put that up against and like a way to follow it and feel connected to it and I didn't feel connected to their inner like what was going on inside of them yeah, it was unusual. There wasn't anything going on outside of them, and I couldn't get connected to what was going on inside of them. Maybe because we, like, switched between too many characters at a certain point. And too many characters that didn't really matter. Yeah, like I said, I don't even remember Ray dying. I actually just assumed that we were supposed to understand that Ray had died. And yeah. I don't know if I just skipped that chapter or if I just, like, wasn't paying attention. Yeah. And then I wanted to talk about um, that candle boy at the end. Fuck that candle boy. That Alice meets at that, like, vigil. He has this line. Because Alice is, like, in her head during the narration here. She's like, I don't like this guy as he's talking to her. But he says this thing that I think might sum up this book if we were to give it a summary where it says uh, on this is on page 306 where he says concern is the new consumerism a person's worth can be measured by the number and intensity of his concerns yeah i mean i would think that is a summary i think you're right i think that's like the thesis and maybe that's why she so cleverly put it right at the end. Right. You know? But I also think you could have offered this to us up front and also had something happen and not been like, everything's a performance. Alice is actually just a consumerist. Like, right. she's, you know, out, like everything that she hates about the world is like also something she should actually kind of hate about herself. And it's like true. But I think that we could have gotten that sooner and felt more connected with uh -huh. that idea through the action of the novel. Yeah, there could have been more for that. But yeah, concern is the new consumerism. Yeah, I mean, this was written in 2000. That sounds about right. Yeah. Yeah. And when you think, yeah, the commodification of concern. Well, you know, the it's the same thing with the performance of, like, certain activism, right? Or if you are not for X cause, if you don't, like, if you are not able to talk about, you know, whatever it is, whatever, the, like, the hot issues are of the time, like, you know. 
Yeah, well, that's exactly that's the summing up, right? It's the commodifying of concern. So it is you're not, you know, you're consuming things based on this concern, whether it's genuine or not. So in Alice's case, if she's concerned about the environment, and I would argue if I'm being fair or trying to be as fair here to Williams and what she's trying to say with this book, if I had to give it a theme loosely, I'd be like, okay, this kind of the inevitable march forward of progress. And by progress, I don't necessarily mean like political, the way people use that word. I mean, just, you know, just progressing periods. So like we industrialization, mass producing products, making people's lives easier, but that comes with this kind of cost. So this kind of like, but also like the inevitable push forward of progress, but also like how banal that is, like how just ordinary and not sexy and not pretty. And actually it destroys a fuckload of shit in the process, you know? Yeah. And it's kind of just, but like, even though it does those things that we would consider bad, it's still incredibly banal. Like there is very little, you know, like evil motivation or anything behind it. It's just like the banal reality of living and or in this case dying for this book. But yeah, I would say that was probably the overall theme. But I yeah, this... I think I think that's like a, such a largely true statement that maybe was like really sexy at the moment. Yeah. I mean, maybe it still is like, honestly, maybe it's a message that like we never actually learned, <laughs> but you know, what do you think it's, I mean, I don't know. I mean, is it, I think that's part of it too, is that it's not necessarily trying to give us a lesson as much as it's just showing us the reality. Yeah. And maybe. you know, maybe that's what it's trying to do. I think, you know, I would, I would say, you know, maybe if there were a plot, it would be trying to give us that lesson, but Which... yeah, it's so much, it's just so much. It's so thick with all of it. And I do feel like it's summed up by that one statement. Yeah. Concern is and the it's new like, consumerism. In some ways, you know, I mean, I do think like Alice is the least honest character. Like, right. Like I said earlier, it's like sort of on a spectrum. Like Annabelle is this like super material girl. Corvus is like just super depressed and cannot actually care about other things like the way that alice has room to care like because she's just sort of consumed with mourning right and it's like alice's life actually isn't that bad and she's like looking for all of these causes but and you, like there was even this moment where she was talking about how her grandfather was like watching more and more cable news all the time now and I was like you know the whole thing it's that the whole thing feels like commentary without anything to com like to push me forward in it you know and yeah. I do want this to be a piece of entertainment you know no, it's it like maybe it's not trying to teach us the lesson but I do feel like it is it wouldn't have this dumb fucking candle guy Right at the end, you know, is this Alice's coming of age? Is she about to, like, find out that this is all kind of bullshit and maybe break free from this sort of world of ideas that her she was raised into? But I don't know. Like, the conflict... To land there, the conflict mm -hmm. didn't feel like enough. Yeah. It didn't feel like there was a single central conflict for Alice. Right. Of like Except, Alice. Yeah. If we if we got something of like Alice trying to do something in like the vein of eco terrorism and it failing would have just been more than what we got. Like that would have been enough to let us have this little speech at the end by this random character that pops up and is basically, yeah, like selling concern. Right. Like selling you know, concern is a new consumerism. Even if there was yeah. like a central like relationship that she was navigating or a central problem that she was trying to navigate, like, you know, I mean, we're just talking about looking for plot now, it feels like. Yeah, uh, I think this book would definitely yeah. need it too. 
But yeah, I feel like it doesn't. It we just pass through this cast of characters that she interacts with, and some that she doesn't, who in many cases are giving us not always us like they're giving each other their life philosophies and then sometimes they're internally giving it but also sometimes they're admitting that they're not certain or like we're you you can see that there's performance there yeah but it's so scattered well that leads me i'm bored yeah, I mean, that leads me to my last question, which is, yeah, what is this novel about? Or did we already just answer that question? I think we did, I mean. Because there was a part of me where it's like, yeah, I didn't even quite buy the eco-terrorism stuff. Like, I didn't even quite buy the concern that Alice was, like, voicing to people as they're like, would you like, you know, are you hungry? She's like, I don't eat this, or, you know. Yeah, no, I didn't believe in her actual right. care i think like i get the sense that this is like how she was raised but like and that she wants to seem edgy and that this is more a product of that than anything like i, I think it's all it's all it's all a performance and unless you can get beyond that we're just living a life of death or is that it anyway i don't know like, what do you think, though? What do you, like, what do you think it... If I, decided... I mean, I think you sort of hit it on the head before. Yeah. I... That's... Yeah, I don't know. <clears throat> and I don't know if... If I had to say anything, I would say I think that Williams in this novel is trying to critique this kind of false concern. That it's like, it's a fashion statement. You can wear this now. You can wear the bumper sticker. You can light a candle and hold it at a vigil for, like, deforestation or something. Or, like, the building of a dam. And you can pretend that it's doing something and you can pretend that it's even fulfilling you, like giving you some type of purpose, but it's, you know, it's not right. Like at the end of it, it's just, well, the things that give you purpose aren't necessarily doing that thing. It's like whatever else you're getting from it, like whatever other sort of, you know, recognition you might get or acknowledgement you might get or, um, you know, social standing, yeah, it's just the same. That's what I mean. Yeah. So, and then it. Or having of... people see you a certain way. Yeah. So yeah, maybe that's the case. Is that that this was shortlisted because it is at the time it was touching on some things that were happening in the culture. That are still like happening. Yeah, you know? and have been happening for. I mean, you know, the Earth First people from the seventies, right? Like, I mean you know there's always been this level of but even like this idea of concern as like a commodity which i think i'm sure has like you know for as long as there has been a cause that people fought for i'm sure there has been plenty of that maybe not always from the group that was like sincerely like experiencing the consequences of whatever you know issue was you know they were taking action against but um, I'm sure in many realms of white suburban society, you know, I'm sure people have been doing just this for ages, even when we read Edith Wharton, <laughs> you know, everybody kinds thinks of, like the kinds of concerns that people talk about as like, you know, whatever the, is like the hot thing in the culture at the time. Like it's, uh, that scene in American Psycho where he's at dinner and he's talking about like saving the African children, like how, how important it is or whatever. Yeah. And he's, and he's like saying it just to like, you know, impress the, like, he's purposely saying it to impress the people around the table. So we really need to give concern about the well drilling and you know, in central Africa and like this kind of like, but you know, it's funny in that sense because you know, it's a performance because it's this fucking psychopath pretending to be normal kind of like, yeah, but yeah <clears throat> same thing right i sent you that quote that pauline quail quote that i was reading where yeah where she talks about like yeah the commodification of revolution where we're just kind of selling revolution back to people 
we're selling concern. We're selling, you know, you put the bumper sticker on your car and you buy the t-shirt and you think you're, you know, saving the planet or something or, uh, yeah, whatever. Yeah. I'm already bored talking about this fucking book. Yeah, man. At first, I just had kind of assumed that she was like, uh, like a no impact man type. Oh, God, dude. <laughs> you think she wipes with toilet paper? I bet she does. I don't, I don't get the sense that she's like a serious. She's got that bidet set up. Set up that bidet. I wonder. Every time I try to look up something about Joy Williams, it just gives me that bitch from the Civil Wars. Isn't that who it is? The actress, you mean? Was there an actress that's also named Joy Williams? Yeah. I want to see if she's got any writings on the environment. Oh, man. When's this... When's this article from? 2021. Okay. With her first novel in 20 years, Harrow. Oh, good. It's nice to have an ad as you're trying to read. Fucking love that. It's called The Climate Apocalypse, according to Joy Williams. With her first novel in 20 years, Harrow, the radical environmentalist, envisions an uncompromising politics necessary for defending the natural world. Okay. Yeah, I wonder how she wipes her ass. <sighs> yeah, I guess she is super into that then. I don't know. I'm not. Yeah, it was like one of those things where it was almost hard to get a sense. You know, like you can kind of see it. And up front, I did think. Like I said, that she would be, you know, a hardcore environmentalist. Which isn't to say that's a bad thing. Right. But it, it was hard to get a sense of, like, you know, her attitude. Yeah, not that you need to. Yeah. That's one of my biggest pet peeves, too, especially in scholarship, is we tend to want to... We Again, we pretend that whatever somebody wrote creatively is a reflection of their personal values. And sometimes it is, but I mean, I think people just, we, again, we, we project all this meaning onto something somebody sat in a room and made up. Like it's really kind of, I mean, I can't stand it in scholarship, but we just kind of project this. I'm like, you know, this person was just sitting in a room by themselves and like making it up, right? <laughs> like they're literally, we're just writing down random shit that came into their head and uh, you all think it's some revolution or you think it's like some, you know, and people just prescribe that onto the writer. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's just, I try to do my best to avoid that. But yeah, you clearly, you write a novel like this if you have some concern for something like that. But Yeah, I mean, and I also, like, wonder if her other novels are written in a similar way. Uh, I would assume yes, because this is exactly how her stories are, and most of them are very tough to get through because they're this lofty, lofty style where Ugh. we just go on forever and we don't get any payoff at the end, and then it just ends. Yeah, it's hard to get immersed in. It's hard to stay with it. It feels really dense at times. And like I said, you don't get a moment. You don't get a breath. Except for that moment at the end. That one fucking scene where Sherwin's talking to Ginger, right? So Carter, who is Annabelle's father, he's talking to his dead uh, Sherwin, the 26-year-old that... Um, Alice is infatuated with right. is talking to Carter's dead wife. And she says, uh, let me find it. It's like, right. It's like one of the last things. There really was an odd smell in this room. It sort of soaked into you. You think I farted, don't you? She said, uh. well, I didn't. I don't for a moment. think you farted. Sure. When said graciously, <laughs> like what? Carter believes I'm shooting breezers, and that's not it at all. <laughs> the 
there's just like that was like one of the only moments where like I think I laughed out loud at that moment. Like Ginger was the only thing in this whole novel that made me laugh. Yeah, dude, Ginger and Nurse Daisy were the two that like were the most fun. And we needed more of that, but like even with that, like that would have been interesting. Like they talk about like Ginger's body changing and shit. And right. like there just could have been there's so many things that the story could have done so fucking well and like did do well, but it just didn't ultimately have any impact. They I, like just held so little weight. I think that's yeah, maybe our taste or our preferences is showing in this case, but still just definitely it's just how we feel (laughs) i want i want to feel more entertained more often when i'm reading well that's what i liked about the nurse daisy scenes because they were always with alice and the best ones with nurse daisy with alice were when alice was saying something and then nurse daisy was just shutting her down be like well you're just a kid like you don't understand what you're talking about like (laughs) yeah and you know me i love abstraction like i love some like dumb ambiguous like heavy like dense reading sometimes you know and i can like stay in that but not for that much time in fiction when like i want to also be experiencing entertainment which i got occasionally but not occasionally enough for 300 pages of reading yeah i think you could easily cut like 100 pages out of this probably yeah yeah not to get all workshoppy and bullshit, but yeah. You know. But again, she is clearly like a, you know, she's a good writer. I didn't enjoy this. She's more successful than we are, that's for sure. Um, like you know, I don't think this novel felt. Um, I did not feel any fulfillment from reading it. <laughs> Except for the part about the farting. That was funny. The farting, yeah. Well, I think we just hit like almost two hours of Joy Williams talk. Yeah, good. Let it be over. Yeah. Heavy. I'm feeling pretty heavy from it, too. I'm ready to be done being bored. All right. What are we uh, What are we doing next time, Soph? We'll be reading The Blue Estuaries by Louise Bogan. It's her collected. It's a really short collected um I, don't, I can't find my copy of it either i think i lost it or it's in a box in my parents basement like halfway oh, across the country well it's only like you know 12 bucks on amazon yeah i don't mind i don't mind buying another book dude even if it's a duplicate like i don't mind it we should if you like books support books like yeah god buy the book if you like books because <laughs> Industry's already on life support. If you all want to, if you like reading, uh, support it that yeah, way. Yeah, I mean, we could always just buy some poems by Lana Del Rey. Yeah, that'll be one. We should go over that book. We could probably do Lana Del Rey and uh, Franco. Oh, God. In, in, one, in one run. Franco's... I've read Franco's. I've only seen pieces of Lana Del Rey's. At least I've only seen pieces of Franco, but it, I remember fucking hating it. <laughs> yeah, I read his book uh, directing Herbert White, yeah. that Franco book. The only reason he got anywhere is one because he's James Franco, and two because Frank Bedart wants to fuck him. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. The, at least at least Franco went through the MFA and like he's attempting to actually write crafted shit, but it's not. Del Rey is just tweets or lyrics or you yeah. know Ugh. scraps of lyrics that she's calling po- well, whatever. We don't have to, we're not yeah, critiquing yeah. that book today, but yeah. <laughs> so next week we're doing uh Bogan's Blue Estuaries. Pick up a copy. We'll link uh the Joy Williams, the Quick and the Dead that we went over today, and we'll link the Blue Estuaries as well. In the descriptions and show notes, if you're consuming this on YouTube, Patreon, whatever our platform you fucking consume your shit on. All right, yeah. Uh, reminder to listeners, we're looking for workshop horror stories. If you have a good workshop horror story, uh, send us an email at heavyboardpodcast at gmail.com. Uh, it'll be fun to get into that. 
don't forget to subscribe to Patreon to receive our full uncensored episodes for subscribers only. Uh, if you're listening to the free feeds, you are definitely listening to censored content uh, in this case. So say get terrible, on terrible, terrible things. Yeah, we say terrible things on the on the censored versions. Uh, check out, if you don't want to support us that way, you can support us by subscribing to our YouTube channels uh, where we post... Uh, free episodes clips all of that check it out and all the links to the books and shit in the description and a reminder that next episode we're doing uh louis bogan's the blue estuaries blue estuaries uh, and this has been heavy board my name's andrew Whitstat. and i'm sophie wiener i guess we'll see you next time I farted, but it didn't make a sound. Nice. Hoping for something. <laughs> a little fart at the end. <laughs> you should put that in there anyway. Put a fart in there. There it is. <laughs>